welcome. You're watching Talking Point and joining us today is a very special guest, Vinay Jessing, Managing Director of Portfolio Management Services at GM Financial joins in. Uh, Vinay, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's a very interesting sort of time that we're going through uh, with the markets. Uh, we seem to be showing some signs of topping up for the near to medium term. At least that's how markets uh, have been moving. Do you feel like with the lack of triggers, election results seems to be more or less a given domestically, the landscape is now beginning to change? Uh, do you feel like a price or a time correction is what is currently underway as you see it? So, you know, a very interesting question. Uh, it's, you know, if you look at what's happened in the last 40 to 45 days in this year, the Indian market is already up. The MSCI India is up about 3%. Uh, the smaller cap indices are up 4 to 5%, even after the correction in the last two to three days. Large cap indices are up 1%. I think it's the expectation when you see two to three days of uh, you know the market correcting, uh, which I think is a healthy correction. People get a lot more nervous. But I, I look at three strong triggers, and a lot of that would come in the next six to seven months. Uh, trigger one is technical, uh, very simply, if you look at the FII ownership, we're today at about 17% uh, for the BSE 500 companies uh, all put together. And that number peaked, uh, you know, in the last 10 years at about 20%. So we are at more than a 10-year low. So since this government is in power, we are at virtually the lowest FII ownership. If the FIRs were to go back to a 20% uh, number, and, and mind you, uh, at the same time, you're seeing MSCI India weightages go up. It's close to 18% effective FIP. And uh, if the FIIs want to get overweight India by even 2 to 3%, a 3% increase in FII weightage on a $4.2 trillion market cap leads to about $125 to $126 billion coming up. And that's not all going to come up together. That's going to come up when the world believes the economy of India is a lot more positive and the economy in the rest of the world is kind of sinking or slowing down. I think that's happening. So that's trigger one. Uh, trigger two, again, technical. Uh, you're seeing uh, the debt. Uh, JP Morgan EM uh, has added India to their emerging market bond. So you'll see a lot of inflows happen in the bond market as well. Uh, again, effective June, July, you could see 25 odd billion dollars coming into the country on a phased manner. What's important out here is the cost of capital or the debt because of the inflow uh, in the debt market could come down. And when interest rates go down uh, for companies which want the interest, uh, you would start seeing projects or capex of India getting revived and would also start seeing, uh, you know, invariably the market do better because, you know, cost of capital goes down and we should technically go up. Uh, the third trigger is co uh, corporate capex earnings. If you look at the results and, you, you know, we are at the fag end of the results coming out. Uh, this is the first quarter in ages wherein we've seen a healthy growth overall of 24-25% of the BSE 500. But if you dichotomize where the growth has come from, it always used to be one sector, which was financials. Financials accounted for 35, 40, 45% of growth because at that time it was not just the loan book which was growing. You also had uh, the provisions uh, coming down. So the PAT growth financials were very high. This time, the financial space has grown, you know, based on our analysts at about 20 to 22%. So it's the other sectors, you know, which are growing, be it auto, be it capex, be it industrials, be it telecom. All of them are growing at very healthy numbers, you know, between 30 and 55, 60%. So you will see earnings upgrade happen in India, whereas the rest of the world, as you start seeing slowdown, you will start seeing pain in their GDPs. You'll see the EPS being cut out there. So I think India has a lot of triggers. Yes, a healthy correction on indices is always a positive. One last comment, sorry, a long answer. Uh, but why do we look at indices when we know that the indices today are not similar to the indices they were five years ago? You've seen high PE stocks come up into the indices today uh, at the cost of low PE stocks go out. So maybe indices is not the right way to look at uh, you know, the market. It's more better to look at the broader depth or breadth of the market and individual stocks. Right. Uh, just taking a cue from what you said, uh, Mr. Jessink, uh, and let's talk about looking ahead, right? So for an investor at this stage, and I'm talking about equities and debt, you alluded to the fact that with the inclusion in the JP Morgan uh, index, you will see, what, 25-odd billion dollars of uh, liquidity flowing in. You also have the Bloomberg inclusion that could potentially happen over the next couple of months. Uh, so how do you approach both these portfolios? Do you think... Uh, 
for an investor, debt may be an attractive asset class today to yield double-digit returns. And of course, the trickle-down effect will be on equities only a few quarters out. Uh, what, what I want to get from you is, does debt look more attractive than equity at this stage? If I heard you right, you said debt could give double-digit return for a foreign investor. That sounds a little tough. Uh, you know, low single digit sounds a lot more realistic. But uh, the point is, as the interest rates come in, the foreign investor probably gets six months to a year of relatively higher interest rates, and the interest rate cycle would come down. So for them, uh, because they are putting debt into the country, they realize they're actually reducing the cost of capital for the country, and the medium to longer term, that improves the equity situation for all companies in the country who require the debt. Let me put it the other way around. There's so many companies, you know, which have a leverage of two to three X, which are interesting, which are today getting, you know, paying about 12 to 14% interest uh, to banks or otherwise. If that interest rate comes down by one to 2%, and if you have a leverage of say three X, you can imagine what happens to the PAT growth. You know, if the EBITDA were to grow at 15%, the PAT will grow north of 20%, and the ROC and ROE would start improving substantially. So I think probably this is the best time or the peak of putting money into the debt cycle. Post this, incrementally, a lot of money would flow into the equity cycle. So you're coming close to the peak of you know a one-year period where you'll, you'll put money, which six months to a year, you'll get a fixed rate, which will be higher. And then if you're pegging yourself even to a floating rate, you'll see much lower returns in the debt market than today. So I would be inclined more uh, that investors realize that. Uh, you'll, have, you'll see a short-term debt inflow. Uh, which will help the equity markets even more. And uh, if it will help the equity equity markets a little bit more, calendar year 2024, what sort of returns are you working with? I mean, give me a bull case and a bear case. So, you know, the, I'll talk about the returns as far as the earnings are concerned. And if the PE is maintained the same, you get that return. So I think, you know, an average case for us or the base case for us is a 15% earnings increase in F25, uh, you know, the year we are getting into. Uh, so what that really simply implies is, uh, you know, this calendar year, you could see a 15% earnings trajectory, which could inch up by 3 to 5%. So I won't be surprised if you see uh, 17 to 20% uh, upside on, you know, uh, many stocks. I'm again not going to talk about uh, the large cap index, but a broader cap index. On the other side, I don't see too much of earnings pain in the overall picture. Uh, I see the earnings, worst case, go to 10 to 11% for the year. I, and I think that's also a stretch. I think 12 would be a better number. So whatever way I look at it, if the P is maintained, if the election go the way uh, people are predicting, uh, you would see the market close to the bottom as we are talking. And, you know, even on a, a bear case, you would see 0 to 10% upside. On, and on a bull case, you know, north of 20% as an upside. Right. Uh... Then, uh, let's talk about a few themes that have dominated uh, sentiment and uh, emotion in the last couple of days. Oh, no, no, actually, in the last couple of years, really. And PSU has been the biggest talking point. 21, 22, 23, phenomenal returns uh, for the sector. And it was largely on back of auto wins, right? Uh, do you feel like after what we've seen with earnings, commentary of management, uh, execution, and the outlook or the run-up, really, uh, seems like there could be, it could potentially be time to take profits off the table for some of those broader market uh, PSU themes. So, you know, it's interesting. Two words I think missing from your question are the PSUs have been far more efficient than we, they can give them credit for. The execution capabilities have been fantastic. So, whether you use the word execution, whether they use the word productivity, uh, it's been very interesting that the PSUs are really upping the game. Uh, there are three spaces where I see PSUs, uh, you know, have dominated in the corporate world. One is defense. You know, here largely what you're seeing is, you know, uh, when you talk about any stock in defense, because the CapEx growth in India uh, has increased by 30% per annum for the last three years and this year at 17%, a lot of that CapEx has gone to, you know, be it water, be it uh, power, be it uh, uh, railways and more importantly, be it defense, wherein you're seeing two changes there. Uh, the government is buying more domestic equipment, so the Atma Nirbhar uh, part of the plan, as compared to uh, you know buying imports. And the second is these companies themselves are exporting a lot more. So you add all this to the space. These are companies where you can't compare their past piece 
to what they can get in the future because they never had an earnings project growth trajectory. Some of them were 25 to 30 percent, or they didn't have moats. You know, if you talk about companies like Hindustan Aeronautics, uh, the moat the company is made is substantial by building its stages. It's got a nine to ten year plus uh, order book, you know, based on Mukunda, our uh, defense analyst. And what he tells us is return on capital employed is north of 20 percent. So if you're getting, a, you know, if you're paying a price of 30 times PE one year forward, and your growth will only increase. It's one of the slow growing companies. You know, it's at about 10 to 15 percent. But with the order book, once you get the first few uh, pages is delivered, your earnings growth trajectory goes to 15 to 17 percent. So this will become a stalwart. You know, the entire defense sector probably will go the way the consumers are going. Uh, I know it's funny. I'm comparing the two, but think about it. The geopolitical risk uh, largely is here to stay. And because geopolitical risk is largely here to stay, defense budgets are not going down. You know, they're going up. So here, PSUs, I think, score substantially. Uh, if there is some correction in prices uh, in some of the stocks we like, we keep on buying them. You know, uh, case in point, uh, companies like Hindustan Aeronautics and Bharat Electronics. Uh, having said that, uh, the banking sector, too, uh, you know, at one time, it, we used to only talk about private banks. Now, the way the digitization spree is happening on, on public sector banks and their valuations are relatively so much cheaper. Uh, we are quite confident that some of these uh, public sector banks would also outshine. So any correction, you know, in, in, in the names we like, uh, we keep on nibbling onto the PSU banks. So put the other way around, I think now is the time still to be invested in PSUs. Two sectors we like in PSUs are defense and banks. I mean, and I'm going to pick your brains. You've mentioned uh, Hindustan Aeronautics and Bharat Electronics. Can you add a few more to the list that you like, uh, that you would be adding to your portfolio? Anything in the railway, infra, uh, even banks. You said banks look good in the PSU space. Which ones would those be? So, you know, Bank of Baroda is something we like. Uh, Bank of Baroda we like because it's relatively cheaper doing the digitization act. Uh, yes, the stock has done pretty well, uh, but that's something, you know, we look forward to. Uh, railways have government contracts coming, but you don't have government companies, uh, you know, which are largely into the picture. But if you look at railway as a space, uh, the capex growth in railways has been 7x in the last 10 years, 7x. Uh, the order books for companies like Titagar uh, is as much as uh, 5 to 6x plus. The order book for companies like Texmeco and Jupiter is 2x plus. Uh, so even there, you've seen a sizable change in the way they're executing the orders. Uh, it's interesting, Rahul, our analyst, tells us what the country is adding in terms of wagons this year is equal to what they've added in the last three years put together. So that shows you why the company's earnings you know, have been growing, you know, north of 100% and still, uh, you know, the future will grow pretty substantially in the 30 to 50% cap cadre and all these three names. So, you know, you pick a stock, uh, but these are long-term uh, bets. You can't buy them, you know, just for the short term because of one reason, they've already had a healthy run. Vinay, uh, so these are government-focused uh, companies and sectors that we're talking about, and you've already listed out the players from the PSU pack. Any private players with a focus on government order or contracts that you're acquiring in these sectors? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting. I can't think of many. Uh, you know, e again, if we go to the utility space, uh, you know, you have companies like Sterling and Wilson, you know, which exist, you know, which are which are not exactly government, but it's, uh, you know, pseudo government orders coming in in the utility space, wherein A, the company has cleaned up its balance sheet. But what's really important is the company has an order book, which is very, very, very strong. And, uh, you know, solar is uh, a clean energy, which the government is trying to focus on. So that's one uh, name, uh, you know, which we like. Uh, having said that, I think, uh, you know, uh, you have a couple of cap good names, uh, which we like, which are in the private sector. So if you look at water, again, one space, uh, and I keep on going back to the budget document. Uh, you know, in 2014, we had 140 billion being spent in water. Today, we've got close to a trillion rupees being spent in water. It's an amazing growth. And here you've got, again, four companies. Uh, coincidentally, all these four companies are in the uh, four plus companies, but four accounting for a major market share are in the private space, you know, be it Vartek, Vabag, uh, be it Ion Exchange, be it Triveni Engineering and be it Vishnu. Uh, so among these, you know, we like Triveni Engineering and Vartek, Vabag at today's price. Uh, they look good. 
a uh, strong order book uh, driven engineering uh, has other things also going its way in the sugar and uh, ethanol part of the story but i think you've got a lot of these names of capex uh, in the private space as well but not the ones we were talking about earlier on defense defense the closest names really are the direct manufacturers or else you've got to go to er and d names uh, you know where you have software and hardware getting involved where you've got some defense plays as well that's interesting, Gavinev. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and continue our conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Talking Point. Joining us today is a veteran uh, market uh, player, Vinay Jessing of GM Financial. Uh, Vinay, we talked about sectors that have run up, have seen valuation concerns, but of course have been are in a good place. I want to talk about a sector that's on the other side, really, specialty chemicals. These were the darlings of D Street for very long, but the last two years have been rough. Do you feel like we're turning the corner for specialty chemical names? I mean, an Arti Industries case in point, right? Uh, looking ahead, is it now time to buy these counters if you don't already own them in your portfolio? So, feel and wish, you know, are two different words. Uh, what, what I'm wishing is, uh, you know, China, which is clearly having a tough time in the economy, uh, you know, it is it is growing probably slower or at par with where U.S. is growing in terms of uh, GDP growth, which itself tells you that it's really growing as slow. Uh, in real terms, it's a negative uh, value. The real estate problems there are substantial. Uh, the inventory levels are high, but they are coming off. The government has cut the interest rates out there, and they're trying their best to spend more money. So it should revive. Uh, the question is whether it revives in six months or a year. And I think that's the big problem with the specialty chemical sector has. Having said that, if you are a two to three year investor, this is the space you've got to nibble in because as the rest of the companies which we largely discussed are close to a peak of their valuation, these companies are close to a trough of their earnings. And when you're at a trough of your earnings, the P may look expensive, but the earnings can really double up very quickly. A couple of chains we like are, are the bromine chain, uh, out here, you know, think about it this way, right? There are companies in India, let's say like Arcane Chemicals, which you have raw material coming in from water, say Gulf of Kutch, wherein you get bromine and salt uh, when you do sieving. And uh, they are every, the gross margins are as much as 85 plus percent. And these companies are getting into derivatives also in the future. And the, the price, the selling price per uh, you know, for the commodity is virtually at about three and a half dollars, really lower than it's five dollars it was in the past, and that will rise. It's already a cash plus company. So you've got to nibble into, uh, you know, the chemical names, chemical or I would say specialty chemical and pharmaceutical. Uh, two other names, you know, which which kind of uh, uh, hit my eye are Tatva Chintan and uh, Blue Jet. Uh, you know, one a little bit more in chemicals. Again, you know, it's got uh, caught because the EV story in China. Is, is slowing down the EV and CV story. And uh, that's why Chintan gets a lot of its revenues, you know, for the STA, which is supplies to China. But it's it's thinking about the future. It's thinking about electrolysis. It's thinking about hybrid cars. Uh, it's got a robust balance sheet. So if you're a patient uh, 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 analyst investor who wants to wait for a year or two, you will certainly make money in this space. Wow, those are truly hidden gems, uh, Vinay. Vinay, quick one on the IT pack, and I'm not going to have an elaborate question here, but just going to ask you your top uh, sort of bets here. E, R, and E space is what you like. Anything across uh, beyond the INFI and TCS that you would uh, be betting big on? Right. So we won't buy the large cap space in IT because we are concerned of what's happening in US. Uh, we think the next quarter would see a global slowdown courtesy US. And before the rate gets cut in US, you know, which could be in the second quarter of uh, this year, uh, you could see, you know, the IT companies giving you more bad news than uh, uh, good news. And that's where we like a marriage of manufacturing, uh, contract manufacturing and IT come into the picture. And that's what for us ERD is all about. Uh, two names or two sectors which we really like uh, are the EV story uh, for ERD, the defense story for ERD, and maybe a third is the airline story for ERD. A couple of names which come to my mind out here are companies like Scient, uh, which is uh, linked more so to the airline story, and AccessCAD, you know, which is a link, uh, which is linked to both uh, the uh, 
uh, airline story as well as the defense story. So here you're having a marriage of manufacturing and IT together. And, uh, you know, that I think a very interesting mix, you know, as the capex of India goes up, as India becomes a manufacturing hub, uh, these companies would gain substantially. Wow, uh, a cue from that on the EV pack. Uh, anything in the auto or auto ancillary that could be an EV bet? So, you know, one of our favorites has been Tata Motors. The stock has done so well. I was talking to Dharmendra just this morning. Uh, you know, after the stock has more than doubled in our portfolio, we still like it at today's price because it's more a story of uh, uh, the debt coming down, becoming FCF positive. It's trading at six times uh, uh, EV EBITDA, where most of the other uh, companies in the auto sector are trading at 10 to 12 times EV EBITDA. So that's really where we are focused on. Uh, so, you know, as far as auto is concerned, there are a few other names uh, we are looking at, but with a valuation perspective, uh, we are not nibbling much on them as of now. You know, there have been a big bunch of uh, upgrades coming in on Adani recently. You had the Cantor Fitzkill that recently, uh, you know, began coverage on them. You have Jeffries this morning, you had Moody's upgrading the pack. Anything on the Adani pack that looks attractive to you? So we are not touching them uh, currently because, you know, we're seeing lots of other interesting ideas happen. Uh, but, but I would agree when I would just look at uh, how the company is improving the quality of their balance sheet, how their disclosure levels have been. I can understand why investors have been looking at it. But, you know, the better way of looking at it was six months uh, earlier, you know, when the stocks were in doldrums and the stocks have, you know, virtually more than come back and done better some of them than what they were, you know, six months to a year ago when this problem started. Right. Also, uh, while we have you, and I think one of the few names that you mentioned in the large cap, or the only name was Tata Motors, but anything else in the large cap space is HDFC looking like one you'd buy? I mean, the last five-year returns have been dismal, hardly beaten fixed deposits. So it's, it's not an easy call. Uh, but, you know, let me put it the other way around. The banking sector for us, now is looking that the loan book is very robust but as you know the costs of fixed deposits keep on inching up and as the interest rates move down uh, there could be a little bit of pressure on nims all over and using your earlier question on psus as the psus keep on coming up the competition for the private banks may increase substantially so for us you know uh, financials as a pack uh, we are a little more underweight uh, than overweight, and we're using that to fund our stories of CapEx and Make in India. Uh, you know, I want to make this a little more macro question because I've especially been asked to ask this for you, ask this to you. Uh, cash balances, uh, at least in the earnings that we've seen for so far, have risen for most large cap companies. Uh, in your opinion, and I know you've talked about private pay, CapEx picking up, do you think this is a precursor to the much anticipated pickup in the private CapEx cycle? A, and also to build on that, uh, what does that mean for banks uh, in 2024 credit growth with a reduced need for corporate lending? That's not going to garner too well for banks, right? While private CapEx, CapEx may still pick up. That's, that's exactly the point I was going to make earlier as well. Uh, but thank you for this question. So, you know, it's interesting. If you see the best performing market this year, it's Japan. You know, it's up 12%. Uh, worst performing market is China. The companies with the maximum cash on hand uh, is Japan. So, you know, it kind of alludes to you that anybody who has cash and you're getting into a CapEx cycle, those are the companies to bet on or the companies which get the orders, you know, which would be the cap good sectors or what we discussed earlier. Uh, equipment players, utility players, or railways and defense. Here, if you're talking about a company which is going to lend to a corporate as compared to lending to you and me as retail, uh, the retail growth in India has been 30% plus. And that comes at a lucrative uh, yield for the banking sector, be it 12 to 15, 16%. And if you move to the MFIs, even higher, uh, 18 to 24%. But the corporate sector is more towards the 7 or 8 to the 12%. So if you're going to increase your loan book at a lower rate of growth, your overall volume of your loan book you know, may not grow at 16, 17, it may grow at 18 to 20 percent. Uh, that will be advantageous for the CapEx cycle. But will the NIMS improve? I think the NIMS will reduce further uh, because of uh, the same reason, because your, your book would edge towards more corporate. Your quality of the book may be better. So if people want to be, pay better for a higher quality book, those are the ones who would buy a lot more in the financial sector. But incrementally, I think you would see the corporate capex improve, and that's the space really to focus on as to how those companies increase their earnings so that the earnings visibility of India goes from 15 to 17 to 17 to 20 percent.
So I would be on that boat. Vinay, it was so good talking to you, but unfortunately, we're completely out of time. We'll hopefully catch you soon again. Uh, until then, have a good day and have a great time.